Hello, my name is Katie Sando and welcome to the Marketing Forum podcast, where we learn about the professional world of brilliant marketers, communicators and creatives. In this episode, John Payne, founder of Noisy Little Monkey based in Bristol, joins me to chat all things digital, B2B sales and the business of running an agency. We touched on an absolute host of topics, but actually John is just a brilliant person to have a conversation with, and I find him super considered in how he approaches marketing and running his business. I really hope you enjoy as much as I enjoyed chatting with him. So hello, John Payne. Thank you very much for joining the Marketing Forum for our podcast. Thanks for having me along. That's okay. Um, So... Start off, please, by telling us a little bit about Noisy Little Monkey. Um, Noisy Little Monkey is... That's not a very good start to a podcast, is it? I went, um. Uh, Noisy Little Monkey (laughs) is... Cut that. Yeah, you're going to have to do a lot of that. Um, (laughs) I've done it again. Noisy Little Monkey is an inbound marketing agency or a digital marketing agency, depending on how you like to describe that. We're specialists in search engine optimization, social media marketing, and marketing automation. Um, we are Diamond HubSpot partners. Uh, HubSpot is more and more people have heard about it now. Um, and it's a really useful platform for automation for both for marketing sales and sort of customer service. So we we get involved in a, in that quite a lot, but we're famous in the in in that we are famous in any in any way. Um, we're famous in a small way for really good technical SEO. Um, and we got into HubSpot because it, we're, we were able to do the bit with HubSpot or and CMSs that, that perhaps you can't when you're just driving traffic to a website. That's all very well, but it doesn't sell anything. And bit, my background is a salesman, so um, I always wanted to, to help people sell stuff, which is why mm. we got into SEO. But now we can prove that this traffic turned into these leads, which turned into this much closed business, which turned into that over the last two years. So, so yeah. um, did you see that uh, HubSpot acquired Hustle? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was good. Yeah, yeah. It makes it. It feels it's a very HubSpot move. I think. Um, I'm 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 not really overly familiar with Hustle, but I just know it's a it's a content platform, right? Effectively, yeah. it's just journalists writing really good, cool content, which is what HubSpot's been doing for years, right? Or is it something else? No, yeah, it is that. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, some of it's fairly variable in terms of the quality of the content. Oh, is it? Well, some of it's, um, you know, like they when things are like totally awesome, like, you oh, know, yeah. what a bad Super absolute, excited. Yeah, like real, yeah. Um, real grab them by the balls moves. Yeah. Um, some of it's a little bit like that, which I tend to find myself eye rolling about, but... Oh man, you'd fucking hate a HubSpot event then, because <laughs> the, everything. I'm super excited to introduce my next guest. It's like the, it's your boss. How super excited are you to meet, introduce yeah. the geezer that you work with every day? Yeah, and you know, quite <laughs> to 19 of us on this webinar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's a total dweeb. Um, oh, we've almost accidentally segued into a current like bugbear of mine in that. Sometimes with B2B marketing, I hit the point where does it really have to be like this? You know, do mm. we really all have to be hardcore? And does it though, John? Tell me it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I don't think it just has to work. Right. I think I get really I really do get. So we I'm, I'm sure we're not the only people who talk about drinking the orange Kool-Aid when we we signed up with HubSpot and you don the orange robes and you go along to like inbound I don't know whether you've ever been there that is worth going to it's quite an experience there's like 40 maybe 30 40,000 people in a um, exhibition center in Boston and it's music it's lights they have like they had the when I went there the founder of Reddit talking which is like my oh my god um, when <laughs> the year before when everybody else in the team went and I didn't go I held the fort at home um, Michelle Obama spoke I mean, it's like, it is razzmatazz. Wow. Um, and, but yeah, it's, but as Brits, um, <laughs> well, I think as any, any non-American, uh, I think it's difficult to uh, uh, really get excited by that excitement stuff that they, 
everything is super awesome, super, yeah. everything's perfect, perfect. Yeah, absolutely pumped. Um, but but uh, no, it doesn't have to be. I think it just has to be effective. And so, if, and if I think about the people we work with, we, t- we so um, my mate Andy Jarvis said to me the other day, am I right in thinking you really only work with companies that sell really boring stuff? I'm like that, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Um, because that's our specialism pretty much and um, that and law and software as a service which is also really dull um, and we make it vaguely exciting but you know how exciting can you make endless conveyor belts other than the fact that apparently they're infinite conveyor belts um, which is what we're doing for a client at the moment and it's not we don't have to make it exciting we yeah. have to make it so that it we easily demonstrate particularly in b2b you easily demonstrate and display how this product solves the problems of the prospect um and that's not necessarily exciting it's exciting when all the graphs go up and to the right as they say yeah and profit goes up and you sell more stuff and you've got more happy clients um who've had um uh, you know an excellent service but the rest of it's quite dull but i just think when it comes to things you know you talk about things like law i don't think anyone's gone like you know what i need a lawyer but i want them to be really exciting yeah you're, you're thinking when you're trying to buy a lawyer you're either thinking I need someone highly effective or slightly shifty um you know you're not necessarily in the space of but I get really um I do quite a lot of b2b consultancy and I end up sometimes in a space where you just think not everything needs to be world class like not all the copy needs to be staccato and Mm if you provide me with another percentage, which is like 3,470% growth in sales, <laughs> then I, I'm not even joking though, John. Like yeah. I gen, you know, you, I see that. And I just think if this is where it's, it's going and it feels, and I don't want to upset anyone, but it feels really male. It feels quite like old school yeah. male. Rawr. Right. Like it's a real know, pissing contest. Exactly. And I think if that's what it is, I don't actually want to work in that space anymore. And I just don't want to believe that if we if if we're trying to sell something from a business perspective, that we have to do it in that way, because there's I don't even think men want to read stuff like that anymore. Uh, no, well, men don't typically read, do they? Once they get to a certain <laughs> level of seniority, they just rely on the fact that they're men to maintain their... Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, no, I was talking about this with a client who we'd produced 2,500% growth in leads for, which we'd actually done. And we actually put on the case study. And when we were doing it like that, we've really fallen. <laughs> Two and a half thousand. It's a really fucking good graph. Um, but yeah, it is, it, that sort of stuff is just so tiresome. Ugh. And you, and yeah, I think it's difficult to figure out. I, I, it does feel really male. I think you're really. I think you're right. And actually, we do. We don't do a great deal of it. But noise, little monkey, and not because um, we, not because of any sort of um, real moral standpoint. Although we have several that we won't go over. Um, but the um, we won't do anything that would embarrass my mother. That's what we won't market anything. We, and I made that rule up. For instance, this is one of our moral rules. When a bloke, when we just started out, and a bloke had, I was charging 150 quid a day. It was just me in a bedroom. And a bloke phoned up and he had a five grand budget. And I'm thinking, whoa, this is great. This is a couple of months done right here. This is fabulous. And he said, yeah, it's called ratemytits.com. And I'm like, oh, I can't in all good conscience do that, mate. Um, I don't. I don't, it just doesn't sound like it's for us. It doesn't sound like it's really good for anybody, to yeah. be honest. Um, there's there's going to be few winners in this. No one's going to come out of it glowing. Um, and so, and then he was like that, why not? I'm like that, well, if my mum saw it, it would be embarrass her. And she was like, and he went, um, are you going to set up your whole business on what would embarrass your mum? And I'm like that. Yeah, I am actually. <laughs> it's a really, she's got a really fine moral compass. That's what I mean. <laughs> But so, we, so we don't, we, that's not actually explicit in it. We have a, a client fit matrix and so katie who's a tremendous client services client services manager no client development manager effectively she's business development but we have a very consultative sale so people get lots of advice on how they can do better through the sales process but as she's going through it she's asking questions either um, explicitly or just kind of sense checking and temperature checking the zoom room um, and one of them is can these can this company be managed by women because noisy little monkey is like 
uh, 75, 80% women um, in the in the business or people who identify as female at least. Um, and um, yeah, it's like we've had, that was one of our big problems was. Yeah. And it's, and it's not just that they want, you know, thousands of percent on every press release or every blog post that we write. It's that they just don't like the ideas that, inverted commas, girls have. <laughs> It's, um, yeah, but it is. I, I suspect I'm preaching to the choir there, Katie. I mean, <laughs> it's exhausting. It really can be exhausting when you, um, you know, in that space where it's a sense of uh, that that's how it has to be in order to, that's what marketing needs to be like or what sales needs to be like. And I just think we're existing in a world where I don't think it's fair to speak to men like that, let alone speak to women like that or speak mm. to anyone in that way. And so, yeah, I just, um, it's, it's a very fine line though, isn't it? Because I think when you've got to a certain size, you can start having some of those questions and you think like, okay, I'm going to kick some of that out. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I would like to pull in place, uh, a, a process where I say if they don't have, so I sometimes work with companies where they have women in the business. Fine. We, yeah. you know, we've got loads of uh, diversity. Nobody is female at a senior leadership level. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Always the way. Right. Hold that so, thought a second. My dog's going crazy. <laughs> I need to just let him in. One second. Oh, God, you're talking about the patriarchy and I'm walking off. <laughs> yeah, bye. <laughs> Awful. Yeah. What? Oh. oh, puppy. You're just reinforcing the patriarchy, you asshole. Yeah. Sorry, hello. No, that's fine. Sorry, woman was talking, so just leave. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, so I think um, that's one of the things where I'd really like to build in um, a thing where I say, do you have women at senior level? No. Do you have a, you know, are you correcting that in the like next week? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to work with you. Unfortunately, I think you also have to try and be constructive. Yeah. And it's not necessarily constructive to say what you're doing is wrong. No, it's... It, it... But equally, as uh, and it must be, I mean, I can't imagine how difficult it is in house if you're in that kind of environment. And I imagine there's lots of it because our lot, our we have buyer personas that we've worked out, and they're kind of old fashioned buyer personas and stuff, but they work really well for for, for producing content. Um, but our buyer personas, just because of how it works, and I'm, uh, it disappoints me. We used to have marketing manager Mary because we're a HubSpot um, partner, um, so that's a good one. And it skews female. And so we decided that we were going to have director Deborah as a um, mm -hmm. marketing director as our persona. And all of the marketing directors we spoke to that year were men. And so the, um, so Tash, our creative director, said, look, it's got to be director David. It can't be. It doesn't skew female. It skews male. Um, and for, But one of the things that, that you do when you're in that situation is you just try and make it better. And if it is... Uh, if we're working in a in an environment where it is clearly poisonous, we do walk away, and it's yeah. sometimes that's not helpful to the in house team, but maybe it gives them a signal that they're, that they're right yeah. in what they're thinking. Exactly, um, but it protects our guys, uh, our gals, um, in that context, um, because they we yeah we can't have if they're trying to be creative and clever um, and uh, have the ha that headspace. You don't get that headspace if you feel like you're uh, you know a minority who's not listened to. Exactly. I really want to develop a persona that's like a CTO or a CIO that's a, a young female, mm -hmm. um, ethnic minority, brilliant. Yes, yeah, and, and and part of the part of getting there is just developing that persona. Yeah, and just and saying, then you you'll know, find I'm those not people. Talking to those guys anymore. I'm not. They. Um... Or you just go. This, this this is my absolute gold in my the middle of my target. And then everybody else is yeah. slightly less valuable to me. And we've, so we've had to do stuff with our personas where we just had all white people because that's all we see. And then you're like, oh, that's because that's, that's what yeah, yeah, we, yeah. that's our, that's our cocoon. And that's not a great, that's not a, even a great place to be. It's a terrible place to be. So we've um, recently updated our personas to include um, much more people of color, people with disabilities, particularly neuro, neurodiverse. Um, and, it's not changed our customers yet, but it's changed the demographic of the people who come to our events by us changing our personas mm. um, uh, uh, and just confronting our own previously subliminal, but now yeah, whatever yeah. the opposite of subliminal is, liminal bias. 
I now have to let my absolute twat of a dog in. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to record a podcast. Aww. I'm famous, you know. He wants to go back out now. Yeah, he wants to go back upstairs. It's all right, Nick. Don't worry, I've got the dog. <laughs> It's actually, it's actually my wife who's enabling the patriarchy there by not letting the dog out. I know. Uh, ah, God. I support that. <laughs> That's um, a problematic phrase. <laughs> I didn't mean to um, turn our conversation into one of me basically ranting about the maleness of B2B marketing, but actually it's not a bad place to be. Um, so what I quite wanted to have a chat with you about is um, agency side. Hmm. I feel <laughs> like agency side is, is hard. You're in yeah. A oh. Spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? That's 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 reasonably true. I mean, it's particular. It's always hard work um, and challenging. But I think the people who work agency side rather than client side at that time in their life, because lots of people swap, don't they? Either way, yeah. and uh, go back and forth. Want that challenge of lots of different things going on, lots of different ways to be creative, lots of different challenges to overcome, and different products effectively to sell for their clients so that's it's always hard work in inverted commas like that it's like but like you know I've been a gardener and digging a flower bed is really hard work with a fork um, particularly when it's really cold and then you've got you know you've got to double dig it let's say because you're putting in some dahlia corms that's really hard work but it's so rewarding when the blooms come up yeah but what you don't have with a flower bed is you don't have a flower bed telling you that you don't know how to dig (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's true well, I don't know <laughs> if you've seen me digging you, you kind of have to learn but yeah no you do you, that's true but then um uh, it, 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 it's the, the hard work of marketing agency side is getting over the is selling your ideas to the client yeah. and, and not letting them be watered down too much um but that's the, that's the hard work of it but the reward is the tremendous bloom whether that's yeah. a really cool ad or um more typically in our world that's oh, I've got a really good campaign going. It's on search and social. And three months later, a bit like, I really like the flower bed analogy, actually. Three or three to six months later, suddenly we're getting hundreds of thousands of visitors out of nowhere, which or out of nowhere, out of all that hard work. But yeah, it, at, the, at the moment in the pandemic, it's really hard, really. Uh, there are some agencies who are absolutely killing it, B2C, e-commerce particularly, mm. Um and that's never been our space. So we've really struggled. We laid three people off in April last year because we weren't quite sure how long furlough was going to last. Um, we laid them off and then they extended furlough, um, which I felt a bit awful about. But actually, we did. We, I did a lot of work on LinkedIn. And they've all got jobs at a competitor now. They're all at the same competitor, which is a bit worrying. Oh, yeah. um, it's not uh, ESM inbound. Lovely people. Really, really lovely team. And I'm, they, it's even lovelier now. It's got three X monkeys in it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, uh, the the working from home. And I'm again, we see this with our clients as well, particularly people in marketing who are often quite gregarious. Um, even if they're introverts, they do have that kind of ambivert thing where they need to exchange ideas or they need to be in a room with people um, to, to really um, come into their own. Um, and we've got, we've, we see it with our team and with our clients where everybody is feeling really ground down and mm. not simply ground down. It's that there's, you know, there's real mental health issues. We've got one or two at work where we've got people who are really suffering with I one or two at work. We've got people suffering with anxiety. Um, I was, um, as my mother would say, under the doctor in January because I was so anxious. I was having panic attacks. Yeah, man. I'm an old white guy. There is nothing wrong in my life because I have so much privilege yet. Even this old white guy, and I can pay my mortgage. I've got plenty of money. Yeah. Not rich, but, you know, I've got enough money for beer and chips, as my mate Farmer Mike says. Um, but, you know, I was having panic attacks. Um, and uh, uh, we've a couple of other, the other team members are also suffering. We've None of us are hard up. No. But it is just the situation I think we find ourselves in and the lack of contact with humans in all sorts of ways. I mean, this yeah. is pretty good, but it would be much cooler if we were ha- we'd have just gone and had coffee together first wine did i hear you say yeah definitely wine <laughs> definitely <laughs> wine. um it's uh, i think you're right that there's something about marketers um where 
you know, like you say, I think it's more to do, I don't necessarily think it's always character type, but it's to do with how our job requires idea generation. Mm. Yeah. And idea generation in like an, on your own in a room, you're like, yeah, that could work. And, you know, you've got nobody to kind of challenge or, you know, isolate anything. And I think, for you know, for me, that's where I was fine until I moved. And then moving right. to a new area, suddenly I'm like, um, even if I wanted to meet someone, I couldn't because <laughs> yeah. I didn't know anyone. Yeah. So you can't even bump into neighbours when you're out on the way to the shops, which no. is kind of like the lifeline that we're all, oh man, I'm really sorry about that, Katie. <laughs> that worry. sucks. It's only another few months. Oh God, <laughs> what have I said? <laughs> just hold on. But it does feel like at that point, doesn't it? Like just yeah. hold on and you just think, but yeah, I, um, no, it's, it's a real challenge. And, but I think on the, um, back to the kind of agency sense, what I love about agencies is the fact that you guys get a lot of experience quickly because you have got loads of different clients. You get a, you can test things more quickly than in-house. What I mm. think where agencies, you guys are like, you have to be so strong, you know, and that's what we get to have a chat with you about. Managing clients is, is a big thing for agencies. Yes. Yeah. As in, yeah, there's the practical side of just making sure that you're, that you're talking to them in, in at the right times and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, I guess, uh, uh, and, and again, it's, it's reflected in house. It's that thing of the thing that we, that we, that is most soul destroying as an agency, someone working in an agency as an account manager or as a creative or as like, like a head of SEO, who's arguably the biggest geek in the world Um but he, we're all creative in our own ways. He's he's very creative in his way of going, oh, right, well, this is what people are searching for. This is what my client is selling. There's a, there's a mismatch. Okay, let me figure out how I can I can join those two things together so that we can get more traffic to the website. But the client, you know, just never had the the, the wherewithal to think about before. Um, but we're all creative in our own ways. And the thing that, that is most soul-destroying is when you um, – present your ideas and you don't get them over the line mm. um and or it gets watered down oh so i really like your ideas um but um doesn't really fit within our brand guidelines um and the i'm never going to get this past the board so um actually can you just make it really vanilla <laughs> well yeah but we so one of the ways we get by get around it and actually a lot of our clients then bring this in-house and do it is uh, 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 to, to get there because we, we collaborate with our clients and over time we try and get them to fire us because you shouldn't be paying an agency to do SEO and social media and all of that kind of stuff. If you can just get a team in-house, so a, like marketing manager builds their team, gets in some junior people. If we've helped them put together a strategy over time, that team should be able to, well, as they bring people in, we should be able to give them a bit of a handover, a bit of training. They should be able to do as well as us and then begin to do much better than us because they are in the client full time, whereas we're doing, you know, spits and spots because we've got lots of different clients. So that's our ambition with all of our clients. And what we do is say, you know, copy what we do to get your, your, your really good ideas that you're really passionate about over with the board. And so when we're talking to clients, the first thing we do is talk about their challenges, um, their plans to overcome those challenges, um, and the budget that they've got to overcome them, which is kind of a salesy thing as well. But if you think about it like that, that's particularly often how you know, the board of, a, of, a bit, of most companies will think about what's our challenge, what's our plan to overcome it, what's our budget, and what's our, what's our timeline? Um, and, um, and then does all of that work? Or do we need more budget? Do we need better plans? Do we need more time or whatever? And if you think about that and then add on, What's your goal at the end of it? Where do you want to be? And put a number on that, whether that's visits to the website, whether it's engagement on social media. We talk about we have to keep getting people off of hat, getting more followers on social media and going, if we get you engagement, you'll get the followers. Mm. And this conversation again yesterday with a high street, high street brand, amazingly. Um, uh, we've only got a couple of clients that you'll have heard of. And uh, this one was like, come on, guys, you don't need to be as big as DFS you've got like five times the engagement and it's all good and they're getting yeah. a lot of complaints. I can't say the clients. They can't so help the themselves NBA. though, can they? It's because you almost see the numbers as being the credibility. Like, and I yes. think people just associate it 
Yeah. So what we then, so the way we get around that is go, look, so these are the goals that we're going to outline and they're all tied to revenue. Pro, and, and like if with that, when it's noisy little monkey who are doing it, we talk about all of the goals being tied to profit, like if, if it's for ourselves, but we can't actually affect the profitability of a business other than sell them more stuff. So, if, so we always talk about revenue with a client, but it's useful to acknowledge as a marketer, particularly in-house, that you understand just selling more doesn't necessarily make more profit. It has to be sold at a profit. It has to be stuff that you've got in stock or it has to mm. be services that are profitable and you know the team isn't crap. So acknowledging that, but then going, look, I'm in marketing. So all I can do is talk to you about revenue. So yeah. this is this is your revenue goal business for the for the for the year. We can help you achieve that by doing items one, two, and three. These are our goals, which are kind of lead indicators to that revenue goal. This is what we'll do. And then you go, our plans aren't big enough and our, or aren't cool enough. And our, t- our budget isn't big enough because you want to do that by the end of the year. So either give me two years or give me more budget and let me um, do cooler stuff. Um, and often that doesn't lead to a, oh, yeah, here's, here's double the budget and do what you like. It leads to, okay, we'll come back with some, some better plans. And you get to go away and suddenly they're asking you to do cool stuff to help them hit their targets. And that doing it that way, it's slightly different when we're doing it from a technical perspective, but certainly from a kind of general marketing perspective um, on when you're talking about digital marketing specifically, because it's all so measurable, you can say, right, well, visits to the website leads to this much conversions, you know, this many inquiries. So typically like between one and 3%, let's say. Well, okay, I'm gonna do, you know, I need to do a lot of work to get that from that those visits up doubled or I could just improve the conversion rate by um twenty uh, percent and that would that would give us an extra twenty percent revenue because I'm giving the sales team twenty percent more leads so rather than spend billions on SEO or millions on SEO or even tens of thousands and I would suggest spending all of those at noisylittlemonkey.com <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but rather than spending money on SEO or time and effort on SEO we often say we'll spend it on conversion rate because that'll help you hit your target much quicker but it's really hard. You still got to do all the work and got to, got to yeah. just sort of um, do some tests. But you're much more likely to be able to get that over the line if you say to the your board um, or your bosses. And sometimes it's the sales director is in charge of the marketing team, which is sometimes which I I really like because I'm a salesperson. But often that drives a clash. But if you say what are your metrics that you're trying to hit, I'll show you how I'm going to help you hit them they'll often really get on board with it and release. So we get, we have clients walk through the door and tell us they've got three grand budget. And so I've got one in mind, an example in mind, who said they had three grand for three months. They are now on a 33,000 pound retainer per quarter. And they, uh, yeah. And it was like, well, what are your goals? Right. And you've given us a three grand budget to help you triple the size of your business in 24 months. It's not good enough. And they're like that. Well, some other agencies have said they'll do it. All right. Well, go and talk to them and we'll see you in 12 when you're screwed. And it was, I mean, it was a bit more sophisticated than that, but it happens all all the time. But it's it's partially because we're okay at sales. But the the big deal is going, what are your goals? What are the challenges for you to get there? And your what are your plans? Okay, your plans can't overcome your challenges, so you need more budget. Oh, you haven't got any budget. All oh, right. Okay. So it's just me. Right. Let me tell you what the plan is to get you to that goal, yeah. But it's which hopefully enables marketers to do slightly more imaginative and creative work when they've been bogged down for a bit. And the other thing is, is when they smash it, if they don't then get a pay rise, they can leave and they've got a really good thing on their CV. Yeah. A great. I did this. Thing. Yeah. And it was a 5,024% increase. <laughs> <laughs> just that's what uh, the, 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 their CV is landscape yeah and it's 5,024 percent is just yeah. <laughs> in big it's red just caps. some stats just some stats um, yeah. um how do you guys mainly get clients uh well uh we where we started uh 12 13 years ago um when we first started we said we're going to blog because you can do SEO. We were an SEO, right? We're an SEO company, and we said you you can you can you can uh, do all of the SEO in the world to your existing website and make it really SEO'd to bits, whatever that looks like. Um, but actually, without 
regular content updates um, and not updates, new, fresh content that answers the questions your prospects are asking about any part of their business that you can help with. Um, so we blog. We blog a lot. We blog less now than we did when I first started. I used to blog like once a day when we first started. Oh, my God, but that's so like Seth Godin. Yeah, yeah, and I'm bald um, and, <laughs> and odd-looking. Yeah. I was going glasses. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but I am also odd-looking. He's, he's better odd-looking than I am. I'm just like... A man from the estate. He's like easily caricatured. Yeah, he is. He is. My wife loves him and repeatedly sends me emails that he sent her. I believe, I hope she's on some sort of mailing list. Yeah, and it's not personal. <laughs> but she's, Seth says this, just because I look a bit like him, do you send him my emails? <laughs> we need we need more lines. No. <laughs> Why am I receiving this, says Seth Godin. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we, we blog and we blog about, um, we, we do loads of search term research, obviously. Answer the Public is a really good place to go. It's free. You can have five searches a day to go and see, use it to see the questions your prospects are asking um, of Google. It goes and scrapes it. You know, I've, I've got, there's a whole blog on our website about how to use it, but so we go and look at something like Answer the Public. And the reason I say that and not all of the other tools that anybody who's done any SEO like SEMrush or Ahrefs or any of that have done is because actually it just it goes a bit further away from the kind of data that they use and all SEO use, ACOs use, and goes to a bit more about customer-focused stuff. So there's a bit more winnable battles. So we, so we look at what questions our customers are answer, our clients are asking, or we ask them directly, what were you asking? Why, why did you come to us? Um, and then we write blogs that answer those questions. So, for instance, at the moment, I've just written a blog that is 121 open questions for salespeople. Um, and, God, dull listicle, as you can um, ever imagine. And we're not BuzzFeed, so it's not getting that much. But went crazy on LinkedIn. We now get um, two or 300 visits a month from search. That'll go up to two or 3,000 for a bit. Um, and it's because that's the questions our clients are asking because they've got to do sales training and they've forgotten all of the cool open questions. It'd be really good if they just had a list. So, um, and how to handle incoming phone calls. No one's answering that. Effectively. Hello? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> there is a fucking pandemic on. Why are you calling? Um, actually, it's terribly hypocritical because a switchboard at work at the office comes to my mobile and everybody else um, has turned off their mobile app to pick up the course so i get them all and i've been ignoring it because i'm not that no, who's calling the office they should be coming through the contact form three or four inquiries they've just gone unmet <laughs> oh, um, yeah but yeah so so we blog about the specifically about the things that our clients are interested in and we get loads of traffic um uh we do a tiny little bit of paid now um so on google and we also run um, events. We've got a quarterly one, which is a HubSpot user group. We have a monthly one called Business as Unusual, which I thought was a really cool name until I realized it was Anita Roddick's bio, uh, autobiography. Um, so she, Anita Roddick outranks me, which is ironic because she was the photo we used for um, the persona director, Deborah. Um, I don't know why Maybe we used it. Maybe it was Anita all Roddick. subliminal. Yeah, yeah. Although Kelvin Newman, who runs um, Brighton SEO, suggested the name to me. So maybe he was just trying to kibosh my desire to yeah. outperform Kelvin and his amazing work, which we'd never be able to do. But yes, yeah, so we run that and then we run a biannual conference twice yearly. Is that biannual? I don't know how that works. It means both. Does it? I, oh. <laughs> which I is, think... just feels so right. <laughs> So bi-weekly means fortnightly or twice a week? Well, yeah, I believe so. Which Katie, is why it's come just... on. <laughs> because we've all Googled that. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean... Well, how... not all of us, apparently. <laughs> how are you supposed to know? That's why it's a stupid... Wow. Okay, so we have a biannual conference, which so is twice that... yearly in this case. <laughs> <laughs> Although in 2020... Um, other stuff was happening and we decided that we'd cancel our April conference. Don't know why. I'll have to ask Claire who runs it. Um, but yeah, so uh, we, we run that and we'll, uh, the last one was in November 
which was the first one we'd done entirely online on you a know, platform really called Hopin. You've to got to try it. it. Yeah, so I, I was, I really wanted to get through it, but I was on a client day and I couldn't. But um, so, question for you: Did you create the this kind of event schedule specifically from a sales perspective? Yeah, kind of, because I'm a salesman. But so yes, but the the big but is so it's we set the company up i was really furious with people who were being conned by seos um whether they were small businesses and it was affecting them in their pocket um or whether it was marketing managers getting fired because they'd hired an seo who um sold them you know big dreams but actually basically harmed their ranking on google rather than did anything about it or you know charged them thousands of pounds or even hundreds of pounds a month um but didn't do any of the basics like, Oh, well, we'll do this and we'll do some really cool digital PR for you. And then you go and look at their, the person's website and you're like, well, that's never going to rank anyway, because you know, it's built in a way that Google hates. So you can do all the digital PR you want, but you're never going to outrank your competitors, fix the problems on your website and then do some more digital PR. And people do like we would, and we'll give that advice for free as part of our sales process. People will fix that problem, fix those problems we identify and they'll go shooting up the rankings and never hire us and go, this is brilliant. Still using this old SEO, even though oh, <laughs> and he's fired there, them like, what as you need well. To do is stuff your copy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Use meta keywords. Don't use meta keywords. <laughs> Just as a as an aside, Google never looked at them. Bing stopped looking at them in the year two thousand and two, um, and Inktomi, which is the search engine of choice for all of the young people I hear. No, of course it's not. It's fucking terrible. It's from the dark ages is the last one to use them. And it got rid of them in about 2003. So uh, yeah, don't use them. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, oh, the events we set up to stop people being burned by bad SEOs right. or as Kirsty, um, a client and friend now uh, said to stop people being burned by digital charlatans so come to the events what is, is what we invite everybody to do most of them are free um uh, and certainly even digital gaggle which we do charge for because otherwise people don't turn up to a thing that we pour loads of love into yeah so we charge for that um but we give away 25 percent of the tickets to charities not not for profits because lots of not for profits are run extraordinarily for the profit of the directors and um, I, that that fucks me right off. Oh. So I know charities aren't so good, but at least there's a there's a bit more. It's not quite such a wild west. Their mission um, is generally yeah. a sound one. Yeah, their yeah. accounting is creative. And also, we vet them, so we get thousands of applications. Well, hundreds, thousands, a bit rich. Hundreds of applications, and we vet them, and it's like Oxfam, fuck off. You can buy a ticket. Um, uh, uh, the escape um, group, a group of. Uh, people with disabled kids in or kids with disabilities in Taunton. Um, yeah, you can come. There's two of you. You've got no money at all. Of course you can come. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so we run those events to stop people being burned by digital charlatans, one, um, which is why we started blogging in the first place. But, you know, obviously we know that with that as our mission, we're always going to get business. Well, I yeah. didn't know that actually, but it turned out we did. We do. And it's great. Um and we, but we also get really cool people come along. And the, well, the reason I started Digital Gaggle was I wanted to, I knew I couldn't get some really cool speakers to come along and speak to me just on a webinar when there was like three of us in the business. And there was like, we had maybe 50 followers on Twitter. Mm. So what I did was started a conference, marketed the shit out of it and got people I wanted to, to speak or people who I wanted to train my team to come along and speak to an audience yeah. full of 200 people. And I could market that. I could tell them that and they could come yeah. along and do it for free. And then my team got the best training they could possibly get. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 but it is about the transfer of knowledge and getting really clever people who we trust as well. We vet them really strongly. We get quite a lot of pictures from people like that. No, you are a spammy asshole. I am not letting you near my pristine, lovely little <laughs> audience for you to come in and spout your nonsense. Yeah. So, or sales yeah. pitch everyone. Yeah, yeah. On the first one, we had someone who who pitched his whole talk. 
And I really needed him there because he was a big name and he just pitched, 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 pitched. The problem pitched. is with that is what people don't realise is the fact that it's really damaging for them and their business. Nobody sits through that kind of conversation and at the end, or, you know, talk, and at the end of it thinks like, what a smart chap or chap. Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone <laughs> thinks like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, Although he did just sell his business for over £10 million and I'm still working in a business that hasn't quite turned over a million pounds. So who's the winner there, eh? Oh, it's him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it depends how we're uh, measuring win. That's true. There you go. I've got an incontinent dog, it seems, and, yes. and he doesn't, so I've won on that stake. Exactly. It's all about your metrics. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Good, I feel um, better now. Good, you're welcome. Um, so <laughs> tell me about um, Bristol, please. So you guys are based in town in the southwest <laughs> sorry facetious wanker uh, yes we are it do you on, consider sorry. it southwest oh gosh that's controversial oh god i really walked into that one didn't i yeah i do actually there is a real southwestness about bristol i don't consider bath southwest i don't is think it... does bath consider itself southwest probably not no um so i love bristol I'm not from Bristol, as you can probably tell by my accent. Um, I'm a Pompey boy, um, and prior to that, London. Um, and Bristol is just the friendliest place. Um, all the bits of it that I've lived in um, are friendly. But when I when I first we, I moved up the road uh, 15 years ago, um, wow, to be with my now wife, who had a life, and I was an epic disaster, having run a failing web design company for five years. Um, so when she rescued me um, and rescued me from the box I was living in, um, I moved to Bristol. And as the lady in the co-op was giving me change from behind the counter, she was like that. You're right, love. You having a good day? I was like that. And I'm, I'm from Hampshire. What do you like, want? What the fuck? <laughs> and I was like that. Yes, thank you. And walked out. And then the next time she's like that. All right, my darling. I'm like that. What the hell is this? This woman talking to me? We have What? And anyway, everybody's like, everybody, it seems, it's like that. They tell me I wear nice hats. Um, but we, we used to live in um, Shepton Mallet, which is a bit more southwest. We moved to the country, and that's where we started Noisy Little Monkey properly. Um, and we were trying to get everybody to call it Silicon Mallet, so a bit like Silicon Valley, but it, it didn't work and we couldn't recruit, so we had to move back to Bristol. Um, but, yeah, love it. This really, really vibrant, creative and technical scene here where – loads of expats from London. I suspect I'm talking to one, aren't I, if I remember rightly. Um, I really, are you southwest all the way? I'm Cornish. Are you? Yeah. Whereabouts in Cornwall? I grew up in Penzance, Strom. Pen's pants, as I like to call it, because <laughs> I had a friend called Penny and it makes me laugh. I love Penzance. I know. It is oh, special. Oh, man. Do you get back there much? Um, well, so I only just moved from Cornwall. But I was oh. living, I had, I was living in Cornwall. So. Oh, I, yeah. We talked and I didn't, I just ignored you. Sorry. No, yeah. I mean, it's okay. Men don't ask women questions, so. That is true. This, <laughs> this feels very alien to me this way round. <laughs> Why did you move to Cardiff? That's what your listeners want to know. My listeners probably don't know I've moved to Cardiff. Oh, let's oh, not yes, tell them. She's still in Penzance. <laughs> Oh, look at the sea behind you. It looks oh. like Penzance. <laughs> Is that the promenade? <laughs> um, why did I move to Cardiff? Um, so I kind of wanted to be closer to Bristol Who because wouldn't? of the fact that um, I think it's such a great um, business tech um, scene. Great restaurants. Great restaurants. Yeah. Um, and as much as I love Cornwall, I had never intended to move back to Cornwall when I finished right. university. And then before you know it, you're like, oh my God, it's been 10 years. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so Now or I, never kind of thing. It was, well, I, thought, I was just like, you know what, it's time for a change. And so um, I ended up in Cardiff because my partner got a job in Cardiff and we were like, you know what, that's close enough to Bristol. Yeah. Close enough. And I you know. So um, the marketing forum is now going to serve South Wales and the Southwest. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Also, if you're based in Cardiff, you can work for more Welsh companies and they're lovely. Yes. I mean, I think it's interesting what you say about Bristol being friendly. I think 
Cardiff and South Wales is incredibly friendly. Crazy like, friendly. Like, you know, like get off me friendly. Um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, almost, I think the Southwest is as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I, I'm not sure I could ever live anywhere else now. Um, unless, I mean, you know, unless I had to, if I was, you know, if they sent me to prison, I had to live in one with scrubs, then obviously I'd live there. But you um, could request a Southwest based prison. Could you? I don't I'd go Plymouth. So. <laughs> okay. Cardiff's got a crack in prison, right in the centre, well situated. Wow. Big you walls. Know what? <laughs> <laughs> Big walls. When we moved to uh, Shepton Mallet, we were looking around for, a... oh no, we just bought the house. Um, and because we'd moved out of Bristol because we needed a house that was big enough because I needed a bigger office. I couldn't work on the end of the spare bed anymore. We moved to Shepton Mallet and we were dry. We were, it's a toilet, Shepton Mallet. I'm really sorry if there's anybody listening from Shepton Mallet, but it right. is an absolute toilet. Um, I love it dearly. I've got friends who live there and you know, I'm, yeah, I'm from the race course Don't estate in and, Uxbridge. Like, That's a toilet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, we're driving around just like desperately trying to find redeeming features of this um, isolated little country town. And um, <laughs> we drove, we found found a pub that looked nice. Oh, that looks nice. And, it, and by nice, I mean, Guardian readers would drink there, right? <laughs> so look, that looks nice. It's got um, the umbrellas are clean outside um, and they're advertising Aperol Spritz rather than Stella Artois. This is our kind of pub. We like this. Um, and then we saw this huge wall. And we're like, that, what's that? Oh, massive wall. And we were walking around this lovely wall and, it was, and there's a little alley. <laughs> And I'm like that, you know what? I think this is a cinema and Nick's like that. I think it's an art center. Like, this is great. We found like the arts quarter of Shepton Manning. We got around the front and it was the prison. Oh my God. <laughs> but later I found out that that back wall that we were so intrigued by was the um, o- oldest wall that had been continuously used in a prison in Britain. Wow. And then four or five years ago, they shut the prison. And so that wall doesn't even have that accolade anymore. So, oh man, that would have been a cultural heritage man, icon. If, yeah, absolutely. If anybody's still listening at this point in the podcast, I think you should send them a T-shirt with uh, TMF on it. Okay. Because, um, frankly, this has got really off base. It's gone vague. Um, You've let this go. I have What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Just like... <laughs> Um, I just like the idea of somebody breaking out of prison and being like, oh, I'll have an Aperol spritz. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It is just past five and I yeah. fancy some olives as well. I bet they've got those. Yeah. I mean, actually, yeah. Aperol spritz, there's no rule of five o'clock. I think it's like, isn't it like 11 o'clock and they call it an ombre? Do they? Yeah, as in like shadow, not as in like, eh, hombre. <laughs> different, <laughs> different country. Um, oh, I quite like that. Anyway, um, right, let's get back on track. Sorry, sorry. For like five minutes. Okay. And then have to hopefully send too many T-shirts out. <laughs> so um, if you could just say something of value. <laughs> <laughs> Are you to say, uh, suggesting for a moment that everything I've said to this point has not been gold? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I, <laughs> say no. something of value. Uh I need no. to cut this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Might need to. This, no, this is the beginning. That's what they do in podcasts, isn't it? You go, you say something of value. I end up looking like a dick. <laughs> and then you go, might need to cut this bit out. And then ding, 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 ding. Yeah, see, oh, that's, that's not that's... what the podcast for the marketing forum is like. And oh. So what I'm interested in, I guess. Yep. So you're, um, so marketers in SMEs. Yep. What do you think they need to think about when they're considering things like your SEO stuff now? Do you think that it's so you it was interesting because you said about um you try and encourage people to sort out their strategy but then do it in-house? Yep. Probably challenging for many SMEs, like the smaller SMEs, certainly. Yep. Um, so do you reckon it's a combination? Do you try and get people to train up? in that situation or actually is it not better if they have got it outsourced i was so if i was in sort of a one two man two person marketing team 
um, in an SME. And obviously we are, you know, 90% of our time is spent doing not the website, even though we've been telling the bosses that we really need to spend all of our time doing the website. I would say outsource your technical SEO, find a really good technical SEO agency. Um, And, uh, you know, uh, if, and, you know, this isn't a pitch because that's, you're not the right size company for us. But if you wanted to talk to us about who's really good in your area, just get in touch with Noisy Little Monkey and we'll point you in the right direction because it's really difficult to find people to trust because there's so much smoke and mirrors in the tech bit. But find a good tech SEO. um, And also you could arm yourself. We've got a blog that says, how should I pick? My SEO agency. That's a really good one to read. That'll help you find a good tech SEO agency. Um, Outsource that, but then try and so put together a content calendar for blogging twice a month, ideally, four times a month. If you're killing it, once a month at the very minimum. Otherwise, just don't bother. Um, Just just do pay per click. Um, If you're not going to create content, that is useful and relevant and unique and targeted at your key um, prospect type. Don't bother. Okay. But if you are going to bother and you and you and you can't release that budget for pay per click, then you need to do SEO. And the nice thing about doing that kind of content led SEO um, is that that will pay dividends for years and years and years. For each click you get from pay per click, you have to pay every time someone clicks. But we've got blog posts that get three or four thousand to noisy little monkey they get three or four thousand visits a month and it costs us nothing mm. and we did them four or five years ago so and then when just... you look back you think oh my god i need to update that yeah exactly it's entirely wrong <laughs> um, although typically so people always say, and that's the other thing that, you know if someone if your seo is telling you that google's done a big update it fucking hasn't it's always been a proxy for human trust to the algorithm yeah. it has not updated so significantly in the last few years unless you're in medico legal so a combination of medical and legal or you're in gambling or something like that and i suspect most of your clients or your listeners aren't in that there are there are some updates so like there's this thing called core web vitals that 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 people will probably hear about because it's going to become a ranking factor so how far you appear up page one if you appear on page two it doesn't matter but if you because no one finds you anyway so who gives a tickler's cuss um but um Core Web Vitals is going to be really important for ranking, but it's not a big change. Like Google has always, or for the last four or five years, has been looking at the speed that your website downloads, the speed that it responds to an initial request. So you press enter, how quickly does the website say I'm alive before it starts Mm. sending content back? Are your images, you know, compressed and small and delivered in formats that were invented in the 21st century, or are they all old school JPEGs and GIFs that are really super old and massive. Like all of those things have all have been ranking factors implicitly for years. So, but, but loads of SEOs will say, oh, there's been a big update. So you're going to have to pay us loads of money to fix it. No, it's not a big update. It's a gradual improvement of the algorithm. Mm. So if you're thing one is produce content and thing two is if you're, Web developer, web developer, or your SEO says there's been a big Google update. It's, it shouldn't have impacted your site. If you're doing, if you're just following best practice, your traffic will go up and up and up and up and up. And it's very rare that you've been impacted by an update. And if you feel that you've been impacted by an update and it's happened negatively, um, reach out to me, um, Mr. John Payne at on Twitter, um, or just come through our contact form and. We'll take you through and see whether or not you have been impacted mm. by an update. And we can help you recover, but more likely, more than likely, you haven't. Um, and if you don't want to talk to me because I have a dog in the fight to try and sell you something, um, join John Muller on his Webmaster Hangouts and ask him. He will answer in beginner's language. And he is the voice of Google on this stuff. So you can say, look, we start to lose traffic. Our SEO said we got hit by an update. And he'll go, nah, <laughs> nah, you didn't. Or what sometimes you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got you got hit by a smooth criminal in the SEO. Dun, 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 dun. Um, do you think about content in terms of like the hub hygiene hero that you hear about a lot? What's that? No. Oh. <laughs> um, it's just a way of organising what kind of content you're producing. So hygiene. I like the sound of it. I mean, I appreciate the um, 
I don't know, the, the structure. So, you know, hygiene is like, um, you know, what people are Googling um, yep. and, you know, that kind of bland. Hub is slightly more interesting, maybe case studies, whatever. Hero is stuff that you try and do PR backlinking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, um, kind of. Um, we see it more as engine and editorial. <laughs> We're simple. Um, so you write, you got some stuff that is the engine of the, cool. of the of the lead gen. So it's search engine optimized, keyword search term targeted. Scrub the word keyword from your minds. <laughs> search term targeted. So if, you know, targeting a phrase. Search for the average cost of SEO in the UK. We're there or thereabouts. May even be an answer box today. Comes and goes. Um, that's like engine content drives us loads of visits. One in 100 of them might get in touch and go, I need some SEO. So that's an example of some engine content. Um, how to burn subtitles into your video is not engine content. That's editorial content that's just useful for our audience. Those are two blogs that, that I've written in the last 12 months. Um, so that's kind of editorial. And then we have service-based content or product-based content. So um, the stuff that you're trying to sell. And all of those are relevant at different stages of your buyer's journey and if you focus on your buyer's journey that will help you do it so our engine content is when they're trying to identify and isolate the problem that they've got so mm. in our case it's i'm not getting enough traffic or my sales team are telling me that that our leads aren't high quality so we write questions or we write blogs that answer the questions that person types into google and so for the sme i would say think about what the the problems that you can solve for people and then think about the questions that people ask to try and diagnose what their problem is to get to that. Um, one of the ones I use, I'm going on, so stop me if I'm going too long, but um, one of the ones I use is, um, let's say I've got bad breath and thank God this is on Zoom so you can't agree wholeheartedly. Um, but, um, and I'm going to a meeting and I've, and I, you know, I'm, I'm new to the planet. And so I just Google, how can I get rid of bad breath? An apple. And, <laughs> oh, is that, will that work? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I did, so I am pretty new to this. I didn't know. Hub Welcome Hero to the planet. <laughs> it's the bald head and the big eyes. Um, <laughs> so an apple, eat an apple, get some mints, uh, get some mouthwash, get better dental hygiene, get your cavities filled might be the five things that I see on my Google answer box. Google didn't make that up. It's And if you do it, you'll probably find it's a dental website. So what I might do is just look at that website. I'll look at those answers and go, ah, I'm on my way to a meeting. So I'm going to get an apple or some mints because mouthwash seems to be extreme on the street. And um, I can't, I haven't got time to go to a dentist. But those are, often people think, oh, right, well, we sell um, legal services. So people search for, I need a lawyer. No, they might. But that's not when they're trying to figure out what the problem is. What they might search for is um, how do I remove a tenancy, an agricultural tie on a on the property I live in? Mm. They don't know they need a lawyer yet. They think they could do it without. And maybe they can. Maybe there are some forms that you can share with them. But if you think about it like that, think about what are the questions they're asking and what are the answers? And there's probably four or five answers, four or five solutions to their problems. And the thing you sell is only one of those solutions. Is, the only, is only one of those answers, yeah. excuse me. And you have a blog about all of those, what those five answers are that leads to, so that's your engine content that leads to perhaps a bit of editorial about the call to action takes you to something that, that describes, okay, so we said, if in the case of the dentist, we said, do better oral hygiene and go and visit a dentist. So here's how you choose a dentist. So you've gone from understanding what I've put, the, the solutions that are available to my problem to understanding how to choose a supplier of that solution. And by the time they've clicked those two things, they're going to click the thing that says view our, in this case, yeah. dental services. And they'll go, well, I trust these guys because they've given me really useful advice so far. So think we think about it from engine, editorial, and then service. And each one plays a different, um, uh, uh, different part in the buyer's journey towards just getting in touch. And also the other bit is take your phone number off and just have a contact form. Yeah, that works well for you, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. like to think that that was a greengrocer's blog. Yeah, I and like it. The editorial led to how to pick an apple. Yeah. I'd go yeah, to Alice go... Smith, pretty crunchy. Oh, well that's packed. same with me. Also, better value than the Pink Lady, which is also a tasty apple, but so expensive. Yeah, and also 
they, t- they can be mealy. Really? I've never had a mealy pink lady, if you'll excuse the expression. <laughs> Sounds like something you'd go to the doctor with. Uh, doctor, I think I've got a mealy <laughs> pink lady. Oh, well, if you hop up on the couch. <laughs> grab hold of your knees. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. We've digressed again. Yeah. Um, no, okay, I really like that as a an approach. I think you're absolutely right that it's so easy to just think about, okay, what do we sell? You know, I'm sure people will be Googling for that as opposed to thinking, actually, what do... It's user-centred, isn't it? Yeah, and and people, if it's the first time... And it's typically... We were talking about people... It's, the, it's talking about prospects for whom it's the first time they've bought a solution that you sell. So the first thing they've got... That it, so people who've heard of you or have heard of the solution are searching for that service content that we were talking about or the editorial content. Yeah. But people that don't know exactly what their, their the answer to their problem is and that's like 90 i um, figure i've just made up 90 percent of the content that people are searching for on google but it is it's a, an astonishing amount it's super high amount of google searches start with the word how it's like yeah, the yeah, biggest yeah. search modifier how do i so that's what people search for and they're asking for for answers to solutions service that requirement and you can drive them to your service pages but have doing it like that you've widened your funnel you're getting lots more people through um if you just do it on optimizing the service and optimizing why your solution is better than you know your competitor a's actually they you've you've really narrowed the funnel to people who already know what the solutions are yeah um and often i'll talk to to prospects and they'll say but everybody knows what the solution is in our business so um I don't need to do that. Um, And what we normally show them is some stuff from Answer the Public. And we just go back to Answer the Public and we type in one word, like what's their service? So we're working with a company that does um, a pallet wrap, um, automatically automatically wraps pallets on the way out of the warehouse so they don't fall over on the lorry. Like at the airport. Yeah, yeah. And so I typed in pallet into Answer the Public with him. Um, and he's like that. See, everybody's searching for pallet wrap and all of our competitors. No one's searching for us. I need you to make them search for us. I'm like, that's not search engine optimization. That's branding. You need a different agency. But oh, look, down here, there's a thing that says, how do I make my pallets more stable? He's like that. Well, that's easy. You just put in a much better blah, 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 and told me the answer. I'm like that. Don't fucking tell me. That's a blog post. Yeah. And then the lead is to your service page that is we actually consult on these sorts of things and can give you an automation system that does it. And he's like that. Oh, right. Yeah, but that's only one or two people searching for it. If it appears on Answer the Public, it's in the hundreds a month in the UK. So it's worth okay. doing. Um, okay. So it's thinking quite laterally sometimes around this stuff. Um, yeah. Another qu- quick question for you, and then I will let you go, I promise. Mm. How much do you think of things in terms of funnel marketing and how much do you think of it more in the sense of just like buyer journeys? I, f- I flip between the two, um, whichever is um, most worthwhile. I think, and I hate to do this because you and I were slagging off HubSpot before this started. We oh were. We were I just hope telling- Dharmesh Shah doesn't listen to this. We weren't pumped about some of their language. Yeah, we weren't super excited about their yeah. super awesome events. Um, actually, I was at an event that they ran recently, and in the chat it just said, God, I could do without the hype. This was like two hours in. <laughs> could do without the hype and the big up just tell us the product updates um and they were still is that you things. that put that in no it? no i don't i no i'm already i am not popular at hubspot because okay. we are while we're one of their big partners i'm just not great great for, i'd really like darmesh really have you, have you know darmesh shah have you have you just follow him on twitter and linkedin he is the most gorgeous lovely human being he's one of the founders and he's if you get the opportunity to watch one of his talks at Inbound, oh, I'm in, so in love with that guy. He's the nicest guy. Um, so he's nice. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, where, where were we going? You were going to tell me about oh. HubSpot event. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I was I? asking you about funnel versus. Oh, yes. So I slag off HubSpot a lot. What they've, what Darmesh, it's Darmesh who came up with it, uh, or Darmesh and Brian came up with, is the flywheel, which actually. Jim Collins came up with in his book, Good to Great, which actually McKinsey came up with when they talked about the loyalty loop in the 60s. But anyway, HubSpot apparently came up with it. Um, and it's this thing called the flywheel. It's worth looking up, um, the inbound flywheel. And you've got attract at the top, 
engage on one side. And then if you imagine the other side of a circle, you've got to lock the other side of a circle. It's only one side, John, Jesus. Um, but as, the, as you look around the edge of the circle, it says attract, engage, delight. And so you attract people to your business through SEO and with your website and with PPC. And then you engage them through chatbots, through landing pages, through downloads, through webinars, through meetings, and then into the sales process through uh, conversations and through Zoom calls. And then upon the point of them signing the contract, you delight them. And then when you're, de- the reason I prefer this to the funnel is those in truth, most small businesses get lots of their new business that's easy to close in terms of sales, easy to get that that deal over the line through a recommendation. Yeah. So delighting your existing customers is way more important than marketing to new ones mm. very often. Um, so, and that's why I really like the flywheel because the, as and, and Jim Collins, when he talks about the business flywheel is you need all of the components to work pretty brilliantly. And it takes a lot of hard work to get those components working, but I'm um, Dear listener, I am spinning my finger on the screen. Once that, or you could imagine it like a snowball, if you're not familiar with flywheels um, in engines, you have to build the snowball and you have to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And let's say it's at the top of a hill. It won't roll down to begin with on its own because it's too light and it's not got enough critical mass. So you have to get more and more and more. The snowball gets bigger and bigger and then it starts just rolling on its own and you can go, yay, I'm done. bit like the flywheel. Once you get that work, once you get it spinning, Mm. its job is to maintain energy and keep that going. So you don't have to put so much effort in in years two, three, four and five. Mm. Um, So yeah, I like the flywheel for that because the funnel implies that you just force people in the top and some of them will spit out the bottom. And it was never always that. And I think the flywheel is a really elegant way of replacing that. I think the funnel implies as well that it's just, it doesn't demonstrate how the fact that there's not one, the funnel makes it look like it's a single path. Yeah. You know, almost like everybody goes through the same process and that's just not yeah. the case at all. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that was transformative for us is we didn't make, we put together a really good sales process that enabled us to um, maximize the profit out of everybody we speak to. Um, if they become a client and it was like you have a connect call you have a discovery meeting you have a uh, a demo you have a whiteboard strategy meeting and then we start to talk about price and then we start to talk about contracts and then we so it's like seven steps and we had two or three people go look I just don't don't make me go through this I want to pay you loads of money just make (laughs) let me sign the contract and we're like that no we have a process (laughs) we need a discovery meeting yeah yeah, and we we lost a couple of them who were desperate to work with us who were like that. These guys are idiots. Why are they taking so long? If they take so long on their sales process, imagine yeah. how long their service is. So it was like, oh, take some of the stuff out of the sales process if the client wants to move faster and can, but yeah, often yeah. they can't. But yeah, it's the funnel suggests that everybody has to go through that 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 route. Mm, I'm gonna look up the flywheel. Yeah, it's worth looking up. Um, uh, yeah, just search for inbound flywheel. It will be HubSpot all over the place. And obviously, if you download anything from HubSpot, they'll email you till the end of time. Um, yeah, I did um, download something from them the other day. I was a little bit disappointed, actually. It was one of those, it was, um, I can't remember what I was looking for, and it ended up downloading me a template. Yeah. Um, and I'm not super into templates anyway. But yeah. But it was a core template in my Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think as they've grown from like two guys in an office, they're the, the obviously therefore the, the there are thousands of them now. I mean, there are thousands of there are hundreds of them just in Dublin, and the passion of each individual person as you kind of cascade down the hierarchy is less and less about the quality. Yeah. Um, it's just like they do very well at it. Yeah, I mean, but you compare them to all their competitors, and actually, all of the teams seem to have. Uh, you know, they're a step above all of the competition, but they are a software company at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I will let you go. Thank, Thank you, you for very letting much. me ramble. No, I. you did deliver some value. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a miracle. <laughs> we were super excited to have you here. We're super pumped that you managed to join the Marketing <laughs> Forum podcast. You know, Katie, I was super excited to be on it. You're a super (laughs) awesome host. And I am super pumped to listen to it when it comes out. You're super lying. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love the sound of my own voice. Can't you tell? Oh, my (laughs) God. Oh, no. But thank you so much, John. It was really great to chat to you about agencies and also to get your take on some of the stuff that's happening with SEO at the moment. So um, thank you very much for your time. 
Cool. Thank you. Cheers, and also, Katie. nobody's going to be going to Shepton Mallet now off the back of your recommendation. <laughs> no, that's a shame. It has a really good Portuguese restaurant um, right. that serves good, good cocktails. But other than that, questionable. Yeah, okay. Is. Well, there's plenty of other Southwest. <laughs> yeah. Thank very- <laughs> Thanks very much, John. All right. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Marketing Forum podcast. If you are not already, please do like and subscribe. And you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our mailing list to find out more about episodes coming your way soon.